Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, that is what here. Lamb chop, steak free. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Two years ago, frequent flyer miles meant nothing to me. Today, miles earned are the pathetic milestones of my life. Book tours, the TV show, I travel for a living. I've committed to memory the Sky Mall magazine. The electronic watering timer, $49.99. Duty-free restrictions, one liter alcohol, two cartons of smokes. I've learned to stop eating after the honey roasted nuts and continue drinking. Warm peach cobbler for dessert, uh, no thanks. This time around, I'm making my way through Southeast Asia. It's a trip punctuated with layovers, a purgatory for travelers that gives rise to the eternal question. Do you duty-free shop for six and a half hours, or do you leave the airport and go looking for something new? I say get your butt out of the airport bar and jack into the main vein. Thailand, Bangkok. So here's the story. I have less than an eight-hour layover before I have to move on. I know I can only cover a few bases, so I'm going to choose one pocket of town and try and make the most of it. Say what you will about this city. It is never boring. Evidence to the contrary, I'm not a complete knucklehead. As much as I'd like to careen witlessly through Bangkok, I have limited time here. I need guidance, and I know it. Which is why I'm going to hook up with Jerry Hopkins, the author of Strange Foods, also the classic Doors biography, uh, Nobody Gets Out of Here Alive. Haven't met the man before, but I am familiar with his oeuvre. Jerry. Jerry Hopkins, who's been living in Bangkok for the past nine years, wrote right. the book on edible exotica, Strange Foods. Do you get more limber uh, after a few years of doing this? Uh, yeah, it takes a little while to get used to it. It's good to finally meet the guy whose book has inspired some of my most outrageous meals. I have to tell you that, that, that I have used this as my guide for years, and I was flipping through it and realizing, oh, yeah, I did it. Durian, no problem. Snake, oh, yeah, all over that. A snake bile, never again, though. It's something you're not supposed to hold in your mouth and swirl around like brandy. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that goes down fast, right? Yeah, Jerry, and it comes up even faster. Anyway, have you had Lao food before? No, I haven't. This is called Ba Lao, named for the country Laos. This is the, the Mississippi of Thailand. It's the poorest region. It's where the cooks come from. It's where the cooks come from. It's sort of like Mexicans in New York, all, all great French and Italian cooks all come from a little town in Mexico. Some of the most creative chefs in the world come from impoverished regions like northern Thailand's Lao area. Limited resources force them to use unconventional ingredients, creating entirely new dishes and combinations. So what do you recommend we eat here? Well, I thought we'd try uh, Pla Ra. It's made by taking fish, usually anchovies, pack it into a, a big ceramic jar, throw in some salt, seal it, and let it like, sit there and rot. When they pour off the juice after three months to a year, the gunk that's left, the really stinky fish right. that's left, rotten, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to eat tonight. And I'm going to like that. Why? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> this is like the Vegemite of Thailand, right? No exactly. explanation for it other than <laughs> exactly. you got to be from here. OK, cool. I'm ready. Plara, sure. Chili peppers may numb the taste buds, but bringing up the heat and adding a little cilantro may not be enough to make rotten fish palatable. But hey, you never know. Accompanied by fresh vegetables, this may soon be on the happy hour menu at your local DGI McFunsters. Oh, oh this is the plara. So this is the this is a stinky fish. Yes, this is the stinky fish. But let's face it, we're talking about rot here. It's pretty runny. Slurry-esque. Is this going to make me strong? You make your breath strong. Okay. <laughs> 
Mmm, tastes like anchovy paste and chilies that sat in the sun too long at a picnic. And that's pretty damn tasty, I gotta say. You know, on the on the rock meter. <laughs> this is this is pretty good. You like that? Yeah, it's good. I'll tell you, if I went out on a date in high school and smelled this on a girl, it would not be a turnoff. <laughs> But should that date be turned off by a hunk of frog skin between my teeth? There are plenty of unconventional forms of protein in this part of the world. These are dried frog skins that are chopped and deep fried. The amphibious nacho chip of Thailand. A little chili chutney, and it's good to go. Amphibolicious. <laughs> frog skin. Good opportunity for a French joke, but you know, I've been beaten on them a little. I did because I love. This is like kind of like very, very crispy soft shell crabs. Front of tongue heat. Same I think. Rather than like the full, 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 uh, full tongue heat, this gets you up there. I'm digging the heat on this stuff. This is just the start of my evening, and I'm already starting to fill up. I know intellectually that like I've got a lot of other meals for this show to eat already, but that I tell myself every time I'm gonna sit down and I'm just gonna eat a little bit of that, you know, fake it. But the problem is, I can't, you know, I've worked in this business for 28 years. I I would stand in that kitchen and watch plates coming back from the dining room. And I want to see how much people ate. First of all, it's good. Yeah. Second of all, I'm conscious of the fact that, hey, you know, nice people uh, went, went to a lot of trouble here. Give it a fair crack. Plus, that's some damn flying frog skin. Like that. Jerry's a good connection. He's given me the heads up on a few other places I gotta check out tonight. So we're already veering uh, delightfully and dangerously off course. I'd say this portends well for the evening. Okay, I've got about four hours before I have to start worrying about getting back to the airport. So I asked Jerry, hey, where can I cover a lot of ground in a short period of time? You know, maybe try a little seafood. If it swims, we have it. Okay, if it's good enough for him, then it's good enough for me. That looks like a challenge to me. This looks like the terror dome of seafood, man. All right, this is how it breaks down. Take your shopper's Mega Mart, blow out all the aisles, Leave the fresh seafood and vegetable section intact. Keep the shopping carts. Hire a battalion of walk jockeys. Add a subtle splash of post-ironic aquatic artwork, a hint of neon, and voila, you got the seafood market and restaurant. Sure, it seems a little bit campy, but hey, you could try a boatload of well-prepared Thai seafood dishes under one very big roof. Here we go. We should have happy shopping music with this segment, don't you think? <laughs> All right. Maine lobster. Nah, I've been to Maine. Alaskan king crab. Nah. Cuttlefish, kind of so last week. They may not have every fish in the sea, but they certainly covered the A-list. What do you recommend? Local. Taruba. Naturally, local fish are always the freshest. The, the grouper looks fresh. Yeah. Look, mommy, fish, they're so cute. Let's eat them. Maybe some prawns. Oysters? Nah. Little freshwater prawn here, I got. Leave it, not from sea. It's cute. Chili crab. Chili, I like chili. Oyster, I don't think so, but maybe some baby clams. Yeah, baby clam, yeah. I think that's a meal, don't you? Yeah. Fantastic, okay. Proceed to checkout. I feel like I'm eating at Half Bark. Okay, 2000. With shopping complete, consult with your waiter. What do you recommend? Survive with uh, chili, garlic, spicy. Yeah, spicy. Well, yeah. Blow my head off. Yeah. Good. Not only do you get to pick out your fish, you also get to tell them how to cook it. Deep fried, yeah. Not a kitchen I'd like to work in. You know, I, I kind of feel like I'm at a Vegas casino, come shopping mall, come supermarket, come terror dome of seafood. Uh, I don't really know. I don't see any other Westerners in this place, though, so that's a good sign. 
God knows I got enough chefs in there standing around waiting to do my bidding. And in Kitchen Stadium, it's a whirlwind of activity. They're deep frying. They're steaming. They're stir frying. It has a sort of a kooky, really kooky appeal. I mean, look, out front it looks like a casino. I keep expecting like Wayne Newton or Siegfried and Roy to come through. Get a couple of one-armed bandits in between tables, you know, it would not be, it would not feel inappropriate. I don't know, you don't want to lose all your money in a stomach full of seafood though, you know. It could get messy. That's my clams, my baby clams. And boy, do they look good. Come on out, little buddies. Baby clams, they're fried with basil and garlic. Hey, delicious. You want to know why some chefs don't have eyelashes? All right, these are my chili crabs. A little black bean paste, red chilies, lemongrass, coriander leaves, and crabs. That looks like my crab. I recognize them from his cheerful disposition. Oh, that's chili crab. Oh, yeah, baby. That is good. I mean, I must be getting the, um, the gringo heat. I mean, I, they promised me that my molars would melt when I eat this stuff, that my eyeballs would fog over, that I would soil myself, begging and pleading in a high-pitched, keening wail, the sound of a tortured wolverine in the distance. But does that happen? No. What else I got? I got prawns coming, too. Delicious. Oh, yes, and the prawns. That's my grouper. Deep fried grouper with some chili sauce. Mmm, delicious. Oh, yeah. Poor Flippy. Look at him now. <laughs> uh, Not bad, huh? Okay. Uh, I think that translates to, oh, look at the hideous and idiotic American. Maybe we should stay and watch him try to eat all of that. The grilled prawns. It's buttery delicious. Ah, thank you. Oh, here. They're very good here, you know. They don't do this at Kmart. Bing, bing. Can I get a price check on bronze, please? Rosie O'Donnell in a house coat loitering around here somewhere. Mm -hmm. This stuff is good, but I'm burning time here. Got to move on. OK, I think uh, I got to hurry. I got to catch uh, Don Ho in the luau room. I'd ask him out for a drink after, but uh, I don't speak Thai. But these guys get hammered after work. I know I would. It's midnight in Bangkok, and the snacking possibilities are endless. Street vendors dole out regional fare as mobile food peddlers weave their way through the crowds. So here's a snack wagon you won't find back in Manhattan. Uh, these are crickets. Plain and simple, deep fried bugs. All right, got one. Souse anything with chili sauce, it's gotta be tasty, right? I've been on the road, what, five weeks now? <laughs> Believe me, I know how you feel. I'm in Bangkok, a bag full of crispy bug snacks here. These are actually really tasty. Admittedly, most of the people that come to this neighborhood aren't looking for snacks. A typical cook store fan hanging at only the finest establishments. Pay attention, focus groups. Hey, look, it's Liza Minnelli. One last stop in Bangkok, the Arab Quarter. A little Egyptian cafe where Jerry said I should be able to unwind. After a long night, eating bugs, bouncing around, submitting to the many indignities of television, I like nothing better than a strong cup of coffee I can stand a spoon up in and a good smoke. 
a bowl of apple tobacco and a bowl of omali. A sweet raisin cake soaked in milk, baked in the oven. They promised me it was good. Mm. It's kind of like bread pudding. After two hefty meals and a bag of bugs, dessert may seem like overkill. But it works really nicely with this hookah and the strong Egyptian coffee. This is a good way to end the film portion of tonight's sort of evening in Bangkok. Now, I know there's a lot more to this place than you can cover in an eight-hour layover. But I'm taking off with a full belly and plenty of reasons to come back. But my whirlwind layover tour continues. I'm off to Singapore for yet another quick stop. Yeah, sure, I've been up all night. There is no rest for the weary. But there is, of course, good food. I'm hooking up with my book editor, Alango, for dinner in Singapore's Little India. Breathe deep and get a head full of spices. So, Alango, buddy, what's it all about? What are we going to eat here? We're going to have the best dish you're going to get for the day. It's, gonna, it's called a fish head curry. There's a large Indian population in Singapore, and this is where they come for a taste of the ancestral root. Banana leaf Apollo restaurant. We're here. We're hungry. And we want fish head. Oh, thank you. We, we know what we're having. We want a medium fish head medium curry. Fish I once made the mistake of telling Alango that I love spicy food. We want a medium fish head curry. That sounds good to me. Whatever. Now I pay the price. As spicy as you can make it. Chicken butter. We want some chicken masala. Yes, sir. And of course, uh, two kingfisher beer. Thank you. That's good to start. Thank you. Before dinner hits the table, we get business talk out of the way. So, how am I selling in Singapore? I think you're going to be number one, man. Yeah, I need something new. Alango has a truly frightening concept, a new plan to promote my career. A Cook's Tour, the saffron-colored years, the soundtrack to our lives, including such timeless favorites as Rockin' Desert Love Song, Entrails Make Cool Hand Puppets, and Riding the Thunder Bucket. I think you'll find this collection a very special addition to your home music library. Includes the breakout hit that is number one across Europe. Pay with credit card and receive a free nine-piece knife set while supplies last. Offer not available in stores. So anybody in New York? I think the spices are cooking Alango's brain. I hope he can manage ordering dinner. It smells good in here. Okay. Yeah, we should get some nice chicken curry. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, let's get down to the real business at hand. Chicken masala is a favorite around the world. In fact, it was recently proclaimed the national dish in England. Chilies, cumin, and coriander provide much of the punch. Yes, or not? Oh, lovely. This kind of rice goes very well with, with masalas. I still got to get a grip on this eat with your fingers thing. I'm going to just grab a hunk off of this. And what do I do now? There's a hot sauce on there. I'll burn my sensitive, uh, you know, my hands used to be tough when I, you know, work for a living. But now, they look, they're all soft and girly. Just, you just dig right in. Take a small ball. Yep, be good. That's it. Show off. <laughs> it just goes against my Western concepts of going to a whole meal feeling, you know, right stuck to your fingers. This is banana leaf specialty. Fish head simmered in a fiery curry broth. This is the kind of heat that takes the enamel right off your teeth. That's, that's gorgeous. I think this is a garupa. It's a very popular fish for fish head curry. I'm dipping, I'm dipping. Oh. That's sensational. Fish, curry, spices, one is not outweighing the other. It's right there. It's, it's got a it's got little heat. I can't feel my tongue. OK, let's move around here for the cheek. As I've said tiresomely again and again, the most flavorful parts and interesting textures are found in the head. Oh, it's so tender. The eye is, of course, a delicacy. OK, just squeeze that hard outer shell out. You swallow that? or? You the whole thing, eat it up. All right, a little rice. A little ocular ball of goodness. So good. You're gonna see it's it's so spicy. Good. It is spicy. You can feel the spiciness. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm gonna have to try this, right? Yep. We should probably order another beer first. And now for the real test, the lime pickle. 
pickle. Easily the hottest thing on the table. It's good just by itself. Burn down the house. On a scale of one to 10, if I had to rate the curry on a spiciness, right. I would say one. And uh, I'd say you're full of number two. Uh -huh. Very softly spicy. It didn't set my mouth on fire, but it does have a slow cumulative effect. My nose is running. <laughs> I'm dribbling rice everywhere. I need a moment of uh, privacy. <laughs> oh. Two more kingfishers, my good man. <laughs> My editor, Alango, thinks I need to clear my head with some home cooking. His aunt, Mrs. Gopal, is the best cook he knows. So they invite me over for a traditional Indian meal. There's just one problem. Alango thought it would be nice and relaxing to have a local press photographer join us. The line between sanity and sanity at this point is just, like, just, 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 just paper thin. We're all about to go over the edge. We're gonna have ayam masak mera, which is chicken in a red curry sauce. It's 20. Meet my aunt, Mrs. Gopal, Tony Bodin. Mrs. Gopal starts by making the stock for the basmati rice. What goes in first, the ghee? Ghee. ghee. I knew what that was. It's clarified butter. This is what happens, by the way, you know, when you leave butter at your table in a restaurant, they save it up for your omelet on Sunday, as seen in such books as Kitchen Confidential. <laughs> but enough about me and my fascinating and hilarious book, Kitchen Confidential, now available in bookstores everywhere. Let's get back to the rice. Cinnamon and cardamom. Pandan leaf, onions go in, ginger and the garlic paste, tomatoes, cashew nuts and almonds. And so all this forms like a stock for the rice. Everything that goes in, it smells better. Okay, we're gonna cook the rice for half an hour. It seems like you guys got everything under control. I'll be on the sofa if you need me. As usual, someone else is slaving away in the kitchen while I sit here with Mr. Beer, traveling chef's best friend. I was drinking aftershave last night around three in the morning alone and crying in my bathroom. I think I have a problem. <laughs> Back in the kitchen, Mrs. Gopal fries up the chicken and begins making the sauce. First in is a lemongrass and some onions. That's going to form a very nice paste. This is a mixture of uh, the turmeric and the uh, kalanga roots. It's the chili paste. Oh, the spicier, the better. Enough relaxing. I feel like I'm missing out on the action. It's narcotizing the smell. The tomato puree, and that's the cashew nut and almond paste. I need smell vision for this. Almost done, we'll let that simmer for a minute, put the finishing touches on the rice. Deep fried shallots, and we're also gonna put in a mixture of carrots and peas and corn, and the rice is ready. Action time. Well, I wanna thank you all for coming. Oh, oh, it's your house, excuse me. <laughs> Looks really, really good. There you are. Sensational. Smell coming off of this. So good. This meal was highly advertised, and it was, it is indeed fantastic. The best cooking is always home cooking. So indeed, layovers can be a pain, but they can also be an opportunity. It's been a long time since I last slept, but you have to admit, it beats the airport lounge.